Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Eleanor. I'll be uh, facilitating our panel discussion and some Q and A's today. Um, so I'm currently on the fast stream, um, and I'm really excited to uh, be part of this event where we're speaking to you about the opportunities for leadership in the civil service, um, particularly with a focus on uh, experiences of women in leadership. Um, um, today we have a panel of three brilliant women who have come to share their experiences. So we have uh, my colleague Katrina, who's currently on the fast stream, the science and engineering fast stream. Um, and then we also have Nicola Smith, who is head of government partnerships international at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, so the FCDO. And we also have Joanna McGowan, who's head of profession for economics, um, also at the FCDO. Um, so in a moment, all of our panelists will be introducing themselves and talking us through their career journeys. Um, first, a super quick introduction to the civil service and to the fast stream. Um, so sorry if, uh, for anyone who already knows about this, um, but the civil service is a non-political body which helps the government of the day to deliver its policies. So we are impartial and we serve whoever happens to be elected into power. Uh, so as civil servants, we work on issues that span every aspect of life in the UK, from animal health to food standards to policing, immigration to the NHS. Um, and within the civil service, the Fast Stream is a leadership programme for talented people to enter the civil service um, and to prepare exceptional candidates for leadership positions in the future. Uh, there are 15 different schemes to choose from, um, and those reflect different professions in the civil service. So there is always something to suit everybody. Um, as I said, Katrina and me are on the fast stream right now. So if you have any questions about that, please feel free to ask. Um, how we're going to run this session today is each of our panelists is going to give uh, a bit of an overview of their career journey so far. Um, and then we'll have time for any questions at the end. So if you just want to um, if any questions kind of occur to you while the panelists are speaking, if you just pop those into the Q&A um, and we'll take all questions together at the end. Um, so I will hand over um, to our panelists to uh, get started. Uh, Nicola, are you happy to, to kick us off? Um, afternoon all. Uh, I can actually see you, but I'm assuming you're all in the background. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, yeah, so thanks, Eleanor. Uh, I'm Nicola Smith. I'm one of the deputy directors in our Foreign Commonwealth Development Office. And what you'll hear pretty quickly is in the civil service, we do love an acronym. So uh, if you hear me slipping into it, I'll try not to. So um, just a brief overview of my career. Uh, you can probably tell by my accent. <laughs> I'm from Scotland. Uh, I grew up uh, just outside Edinburgh and West Lothian. Um, I know this is not going to go down well with uh, a Glasgow and Strathclyde audience. I went to Edinburgh University, uh, and, uh, but I've obviously got a strong passion for uh, Scotland and our university. So after university, uh, and there, there'll be a theme as I talk about my career. I didn't know what I wanted to do, so I ended up going out to teach English in Japan for two years. Uh, which was great fun uh, in rural Japan. Uh, I came back, still had a bit of a travel bug. Uh, so I wanted to, uh, eventually I moved to London, started working for an organization called the British Council, which works around the globe, uh, around cultural relations. And then eventually joined uh, the civil service on the generalist fast stream. Now, at the time when I joined, it was a case of uh, we weren't allowed to specify which department we could work for. And obviously, in my application, I, I talked about travel, foreign policy and education. So they put me in tax. <laughs> so um, I started my career in the tax department, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, working on uh, and one of the big things about um, the fast stream is they chuck you in the deep end a little bit. So I was dealing with a big change programme initially um, uh, with the closing of offices and so on. Then I moved on to managing teams. Uh, often a lot of people older than me. 
um, a lot of male teams in enforcement space, uh, which was interesting from a women's perspective. Uh, and I'm happy to elaborate on that <laughs> in chats. Moved to the cabinet office where I then went into your policy type role, uh, briefing both uh, Gordon Brown as prime minister and then David Cameron, Cameron on public sector pay and pensions policy. And then finally moved back to tax to work on national minimum wage, which was great. So uh, spanning a career of dealing with the hardened criminals down to some of the most vulnerable. So that was my uh, fast dream career. Then I was incredibly privileged to end up working on the Olympics in 2012, which was great fun, including getting up to uh, Glasgow for the football, uh, <laughs> London, uh, which was good. Uh, and then uh, we, uh, from then and for the past sort of 10 years, I've been working in the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office, working with governments around the world on public sector reform and governance. Recently, I've moved a lot more into the conflict space. So I have spent a lot of my career traveling. I was totaling it up the other day. And so in the Foreign Office, I've been to over 19 different countries. And I recognize I'm in an absolute privileged position because I love what I do. So that's a quick uh, reflection. I haven't encountered personally, uh, I think the civil service incredibly wel welcoming for women. Uh, and I've been able to, uh, well, as a fast streamer, my career has been quite accelerated. It has been at difficult times. I think the being a younger woman managing men uh, who are older than me, more experienced, that has been a challenge. But I think with mechanisms like mentor schemes, uh, coaching schemes, it's been incredibly helpful. Also people uh, networks like women's networks and so on. So uh, that's just a brief overview. Uh, I, and I'm happy as we go through to take further questions. Thanks. Brilliant, thank you very much, Nicola. Um, Joe, would you like to go next and just give us a bit of an overview of of your career journey so far? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, great. Uh, well, thank you first for having me. It's really lovely to be invited. I'm Jo McGowan. I'm Head of Profession for Economics in the FCDO, uh, a role that I job share. And thinking about leadership and being a woman in leadership, I, I can't give my career story without um, talking a little bit about my being a, a parent so that is going to come in to my story as well as my professional story and you'll see why as, as I go, go ahead. So I went to a, a very ordinary comprehensive school uh, in the Midlands uh, with a fantastic economics teacher. Um, I wanted to be an actress when I was young. If you'd been walking at the Edinburgh Festival in 1987 you would have seen me with a huge latex nose and full body makeup because I was a horse in Animal Farm for example. But because of this genuinely inspirational team of economists in my very ordinary school, I decided I wanted to study economics at university. So I did economics and politics at, at York. Uh, from then I went uh, traveling, I wanted to save the world. Uh, nothing really has changed now. Uh, and so I uh, worked in Uganda for a year with a charity called Tear Fund and then I did quite a lot of traveling. I also worked in South Africa and, and India and ended up doing a, a, an MPhil in development studies at the University of Sussex, uh, where I really focused on the, the economics and the politics of developing countries. So by that time in my career, my mid-20s, I knew that development was something that I really wanted to do. Um, I got an ODI fellowship and worked in the Caribbean for two years in Montserrat, slightly crazy, tiny island where half of the island had been destroyed by a volcano. So there was a very large uh, a British government presence at that time uh, and it was very very interesting to work on the government of Montserrat side uh, because three months later three or four months later I was then working for DFID the Department for International Development as was leading um, visits to developing countries in my first role on the government side so understanding what it's like to be on the other side was really important so I joined IFID after my OVDI fellowship uh, and I went through all the fast stream assessments and all the economic assessments in my first year. 
So that was my path into the, the fast stream. I had an incredible first role uh, being part of the team managing aid to overseas Palest uh, occupied Palestinian territories, Yemen and Iraq. Lots of travel, lots of incredible meetings with incredible people from the Palestinian Authority in particular, memories that I won't ever forget. Really challenging and really needing to be confident very quickly on what I was doing and what I was saying. From then, my Scottish adventure uh, starts. Uh, I'm speaking to you from just outside Glasgow today, and I was the first economist to come up for DFID from the London office to Abercrombie House, which is in East Kilbride. Um, I have to say I moved for personal reasons. I moved for love. There you go. I'm going to say it. Uh, but I was able to have an incredible professional experience because I was the only economist in the building. So everybody asked my opinion on a whole range of things. So even though I was working on evaluation at the time, which was a really interesting and important skill set to, to have embedded, I would encourage anyone who gets any opportunity to do any formal evaluation work to take it, uh, regardless of your discipline. It's very, very useful. I also got, you know, the most senior staff in DFID knocking on my door, which was fantastic. Um, from then, I went to be the uh, lead economic advisor in the Bangladesh program. I lived in Dhaka for two years, um, leading our poverty programming, which was just absolutely fantastic. Lots of work on tax. It'd be interesting, Nicola, to talk tax in different contexts sometime. Uh, lots of work on poverty alleviation, massive, huge education program. You may have heard of an NGO called BRAC, which is a very, very extensive and brilliant NGO that works across Bangladesh that's, that's largely government funded. So really varied experiences in different Bangladesh. I came back to have my first daughter, uh, had a maternity leave and then went back to work. I then uh, very luckily uh, expecting uh, came be expecting twin boys uh, so I left the civil service for three years because I had three kids under two and uh, I wasn't going to have any energy to work successfully so so I had a period away um, and within that period it became very clear that my sons were not developing in, in any sort of normal pathway and by the end of that three years we knew they had quite serious developmental delays um, and were later diagnosed with autism and the reason I'm telling you that is that's the shift for me that my role as a woman at work became very intertwined with my role as a mother at home. It was very difficult to, to separate the two entirely. And the decisions I made about my career from then on had to work within my very unusual um, family context. But it's a really good story. So I'll just go through the next stages. So I came back to work only at 16 hours a week because that was the specialist nursery place that I secured for my sons. And I have to say, our HR were absolutely brilliant at that time. And they said, if you compete for a role and you get it, there is no minimum amount of hours you need to work. And that was a, exactly the right thing to say. Yes, I need to be good enough. I need to compete. I need to do that job well. But there was no false barrier around hours put in at that time. So I came back and worked in the central research department for a number of years, um, from leading on the very large development research programs that we have internationally and that used a whole range of economics and a whole range of skill so you were leading um, analysis on where to spend and then you were leading negotiation and programming and the management of that spend and the focus of that spend uh, and it was a really sort of influential role that I really enjoyed I'm also quite a, a, a people person I've always championed well-being um, in every role and I really started to do that more and more in those years when I was in the research department I, I stayed in a team for about five years and really found my feet and really stretched myself to do sort of broader training for others on economics broader training for others on career development and really start to maybe start my journey of being my whole self at work which is one of the lessons I think I've had as a woman leader that that's been very successful uh, I was then asked to join the chief economist office team and I was an analyst in the chief economist team for a few years uh, and then became, which was fascinating. I did work on inequality, taxation, lots of leadership around new ways of um, what we call diagnostics. So thinking about a developing country, for example, and using a framework to help us assess the interlocking problems that that country may have and what therefore an aid budget can do within that. Um, and then I competed and got the role of head of profession. So now in, in, in FCDO, 
I now lead on economist recruitment, training, all our engagement with the fast stream, um, nurturing that talent and really sort of ensuring that the career journey for economists is a good one and that their impact is, is strong. Um, and also as head of the great thing about being head of profession is people listen to you. And I have not wasted that platform. And I've done a large amount of work on being a fairness champion, challenging bullying, harassment and discrimination, um, leading work on well-being, a whole range of well-being themes. So I'm seen as sort of a well-being champion. And that's something I take really, really seriously. And that's been one of the most rewarding, I think, important parts of my leadership. Um, I just wanted to say maybe two or three overall reflections before, before I hand on. I think the first reflection from my career as a woman leader is people will help you. Know what you want and people will help you get there. And I think having allies and expecting, particularly staff more senior than you, to give you a hearing and help you is something that you should have as potential fast streamers coming into to a structured programme, coming into government. I think you um, need to cross bridges as they come. So the audience today, your, your students, you're thinking about what your future might be. And there's a lot of that that you just can't ever know. So I, I could never have known that I, I would have two severely autistic sons. Um, so there's an element of in your career, crossing bridges as they come, maybe not planning too far ahead always and just making the most of where you are, whatever stage your career is at. I think also you, you in any working week, there's going to be things that go well and things that don't. And as a working parent, you never quite solve the week. There's always something new. There's something unexpected. So it's not about finding the perfect solutions or being the perfect person at work. It's about sort of accepting what you can do and being really sort of pragmatic and actually quite kind to yourself in every sort of working week. Um, don't ever do yourself down. I think that's something that's really, really important. Uh, I was actually at a really interesting confidence workshop that was run by the Gender in the GES initiative, the Government Economic Service Initiative yesterday. And the fantastic speaker was talking about rooting your confidence and acceptance rather than achievement. And I thought that was a really interesting way to sort of flip what maybe where our thinking might might end up being. Um, and just to say, you know, you're, you're never alone. You will always have in a working environment peers, people that you trust uh, and seniors that you can go to. So so do use those around you to to add to your own sort of learning journey. So there's some initial reflections. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Jo. Um, that was re really, really interesting. Thank you. Um, Kat, do you want to uh, give us a bit of an overview of, of your career? Sure. And uh, thank you very much, Jo and Nicola, who are now making me want to look at roles in the FCDO. Sounds, sounds like a great place to work. So um, I'm Kat, or Katrina, and I am a science and engineering fast streamer. Um, I joined the civil service in the fast stream in 2019 and since then I've had two postings in um, the Department for Transport and the Food Standards Agency. Prior to that I was working at, in academia so I'd done my PhD in nanoscience focusing on um, targeted drug delivery vehicles to cancer cells and I did a couple of years in postdoc um, that developed that work that I'd initially started off during my PhD. Um, and then I knew already that I was really interested in science policy from a while previously. So then I started looking at ways into government, got onto the fast stream and had to rapidly remove all the information about cancer and nanoscience and stuff it full of trains instead, because I went into the rail environment team um, where I was leading on air quality. So we were looking at all the areas in which uh, the railway could affect the environment and impact the environment and how we can reduce that impact on the environment. It was a brilliant role and has meant that I am really interested in pursuing uh, work in environment in the future. So it was, it was a wonderful first role um, and one where I was able to lead and I was really encouraged by my small team uh, to take on that leadership and to use the skills that I had to really develop in the role. Subsequently, I joined the FSA, six months posting, very rapidly getting into a piece of work where I had to um, deliver a framework to assess the quality of evidence. Sounds a bit abstract, it is 
I can take questions on it if you want, but I uh, have been really lucky to work with our science advisory committees and the Science Council in the FSA to see how we can draw in expert, expert knowledge and expert advice to inform government policy and um, to inform food safety. Uh, so that's been my experience so far. I've, I would say that I've had a brilliant time so far in um, the civil service and um, one of the great things that I've had is uh, teams that have built me up and tried to make sure that I develop and stretch myself and um, put me into those positions of leadership, which has been great. So that's me. Amazing. Thanks, Kat. Um, so if anyone has any questions, um, please do pop them into the Q&A and we'll get started with a few that are already in there. Um, I think, why don't we start with a question that I think kind of applies to everyone, which is how has remote working been for everyone? Um, obviously, we're all working from home at the moment. So, um, Nicola, do you want to start off with, with how, how you found it? Sure, I might go back to the start of the pandemic because uh, it was such a quick turnaround. Like I, I had staff working overseas and I just remember having conversations with them when they were closing airspace in real time and sort of saying, get on the flight uh, because I'm not sure when you'll, like when you'll get out of particular countries. So... And uh, on that point, what, and I, I'm trying not to make this like a, a big advert for the civil service, but it did impress me actually how quickly, like the civil service is over 400,000 people, you know, and we, we move very quickly to working at home, you know, I'm sat in, in a, a bedroom uh, with kit, I've got a monitor, I've got a mouse, like, <laughs> um, so personally, for me, I actually live in London. So uh, anyone that's in Lo uh, been to London, like I, I'm, I'm not missing the commute on the tube. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Being rammed like a sardine, I quite enjoy having my commuting time uh, to take the dog out in the morning. The one thing that I don't, and funnily enough, we were as we were sort of logging on here. I think the intensity of online working, it takes, it takes its toll. Like, uh, and particularly uh, when you're, like I've got literally back-to-back -back meetings a lot of the time. And yeah. uh, the top tip I've been given is to put the blue light on the laptop so it's not so bright when you're looking at it. So, uh, so it's a bit of a mixed blessing. I like having extra time without the commute but I don't like the intensity of online working and I need to get better at managing that. Absolutely, uh, thanks Nick. Jo, do you have any thoughts on, on that one? Yes, thank you. I mean it's really interesting for me because um, look I just hope everyone here is well. Uh, it's been a really difficult time hasn't it? I've been very fortunate that my family have been well my extended family have, have been well, and I, I'm very grateful for that. In terms of thinking about lockdown working, I'm a home worker anyway, because I need to be here after school when my sons come back from their special school. So I only have one office day a week. So for me, it's been revolutionary. So now everyone's at home and I've never felt so included. Things have never been so equal. I've, I've really... I've been flying really professionally I have to have to say I'm no longer the one trying to get in to the meeting or being the only one on video so or on the phone and, and, and asking the chair to bring me in there's none of that because there's an equality so for me it's brought an equality I've never had I've also been able to share the fact that I'm good at working from home because I've done it for a long time and I've been able to sort of share those tips really important what Nicola was saying about the intensity though and it's meant that some of the well-being work I do, I've done even more of because I think it, it, it's really important people look after themselves. Otherwise, that work and life just blends. I mean, for me, I'll get, you know, hungry children who need feeding. So though I will need to leave my computer and feed them, I, I, you know, if, if people don't necessarily have those other responsibilities, there's a great danger of just working all the time. I think one of the things has been making sure that you give yourself permission to rest at home. So, Nicola, that's a brilliant story about 
not using the commute to log on an hour earlier, but to take the dog out. That's that's fantastic. That's exactly a great story that we should be sharing things like that t- t- today. Um, so, I mean, lockdown working with homeschooling has been tricky. So I currently live a slightly crazy life. I get up at six in the morning. I work till nine. I homeschool from nine till three and then work again from three till six. That has been tough, but my children can't miss out on an education and there really wasn't any other way of doing it. What I would say on that is I'm not sharing it for anyone to say, well done. I'm just sharing it because I own it. You know, I thought I need to own what I'm going to do in lockdown. I need to own, again, the balance between my parenting life and my working life. And both bits need to work. So I wasn't prepared to not homeschool and I wasn't prepared not to deliver at work. So I just felt I could set up a pattern that was just about sustainable, some days better than others, but that I really own. And and that's what I was able to share if anyone asked me, just I own my decisions and encouraging staff to sort of own theirs, whatever they are. Thank you, Jo. Um, Kat, do you have anything to add on remote working? Yeah, I think uh, I would probably reflect very similarly to Nicola and Jo. Um, It has been impressive um, how quickly we were able to all get set up. And we talked about how, you know, all of those people who were resistant to teams before we went back to like home home working, um, yeah, quickly got on board with it. Um, I think that there is a weirdness like, so this posting that I've had, I will have never met any of my colleagues in person. So that's a bit weird. Um, But nevertheless, I feel like I've been able to still build relationships with them, which is good. Um, I think there is an aspect of um, what I think is important is two of the things that Jo's brought up. um, Being that equality of making sure that everybody is included, whether they work from home or not, I hope will continue when we start going back to the office. And also um, being considerate of people's work-life balance and the challenges that they've had at home. I don't have caring responsibilities. So I haven't had to homeschool. I haven't had to consider those things. But some of the people who I work closely with have. So making sure that you have those conversations about priorities, um, not just about work priorities, but also um, home priorities has become more important. And hopefully that'll be another thing that continues. Mm. Indeed. Um, we're, get, we're getting loads of questions in, so thank you everyone um, for sending those in. Um, one that's sticking out, I'm, I'd like to read it out exactly as it's written because it's something I definitely um, would like to hear your views on as well. Uh, someone has asked whether you can give any advice on confidence. They've said, my overriding feeling listening to you amazing women is I can't do any of that, <laughs> um, which has actually kind of occurred to me when uh, you were just speaking just now joe so um would be really interested to hear your thoughts on on confidence uh sorry do you you want to start us off joe yeah sure um well i just told you that i was in a gender uh, in the gs confidence workshop yesterday now i was partly in that because I thought it would be good and I thought it's good for me to be able to pass those messages on. I was partly in it because I really struggle with confidence and that's going to come as a surprise. I'm quite an extrovert person. I'm quite an experienced person now, but I've had a lifelong battle with confidence. I'm being completely honest with you here. So whoever asked the question, I'm just like you. And I think what I've learned is there are ways you can work on confidence. And this, and just to give a few examples maybe would be helpful. It's partly about mindset. So it's about rooting your confidence in who you are and what you bring and not rooting it in what you've achieved or what you think you need to be. Um, I am really big on bringing myself to work. And that has actually, the more I do that, the more confident I feel. Now that can feel a bit counterintuitive. I think when I first joined the civil service, I didn't necessarily think I'd found my tribe, um, but as I've got older and more experienced, I've, 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 del- I've made a deliberate decision, if you like, 
to, to be more of myself, driven really from having my sons and their inspiration. So I think that's an important area, being yourself and rooting your confidence in who you are, what you believe in, what your values are. I think um, a really great tip from this workshop yesterday was about building your own board of directors. So it's about thinking about who in your life are good for you, who in your life are good for you to talk something through with. And that can be an old friend, uh, a parent, a family member, a colleague, a mentor, and know that you've got a group of people that you can go to if you're not feeling confident about something and they, they can help you get right on right back on track. So that's just some reflections, but you would be really surprised how common a lack of confidence is, how common that imposter on your shoulder is. So you don't need to waste any energy if that imposter's there or you're, you're not feeling very confident. Lots of people around you won't be either. It's just learning what techniques work, work for you. Um, and this is something actually I, I think I'm going to talk a bit more about now. I think this is a real theme. This, co this conference, this workshop really struck a chord yesterday. So maybe I need to talk, bring that a little bit into how I tell my story, if that would maybe help other people. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, do, do any of the either of the other panelists have anything? Yeah, that struck a chord. Uh, and I should point out, Joe, Joe and I, even though we work in the same department, this is the first time we've uh, met each other. So it's fascinating for me to hear her story. And uh, what really struck a chord there was the authenticity, uh, bringing yourself to work. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a sort of working class, like gay woman uh, <laughs> who were uh, in the civil service, had constantly that like little voice in my head going, what, what are you doing here? Crying out loud. Um, and uh, I've mentioned it before, there's, uh, there's, I've been very fortunate to have people who have sort of championed my career, actually, men, actually, who have then supported me. Uh, I was very fortunate that the government supported me to have um, executive voice coaching to not, not about changing the accent, I should point out, but for about projection. Um, and how do I public speak? So you can imagine in the diplomatic service and my line of work, I'm constantly having to talk to other governments, very senior governments, uh, senior officials, ministers. I've met prime ministers, presidents type thing uh, around the globe. And I'm, I might cover it. Excuse the dog, by the way. <laughs> Bringing your whole self to work and the dog. Uh, <laughs> So uh, you talk, I'm combining a number of questions here, working from home. So I might quickly cover, because one of the questions actually was how do, how have I experienced in my line of work, working as a woman? So it's been tough actually, sometimes uh, working with, uh, without naming any particular countries, quite patriarchal, like uh, very male dominated environments uh, where maybe their legal frameworks are not as like, don't champion women's rights, uh, maybe like the UK. So it's a constant, uh, something you've got to be mindful uh, in terms of cultural sensitivity when I engage. And there's different ways to do this. Um, to give you an example of maybe one of those quite I once had a delegation to the UK that was all men and I had to talk to them. So I, I brought a team of all women. <laughs> and even though they were constantly trying to direct questions to me as the most senior representative, I was championing and turning to my colleague who was the expert in the area uh, to say, oh, could you please answer, you know, uh, on this? So there's... And I recall that that was actually tips like that was like shown to me by my boss, actually, when I was starting out in front of maybe minister who was a minister, you know, saying and turning and saying, well, Nicola's the expert in this area. So um, and so it does come with experience. It comes with the sport or the scaffolding you get. Um, and uh, I think 
recognizing uh, that as long as you do, for me, I've got a real curiosity and what I love about the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office, there's a lot of the people we work, we've got an absolute passion, whether it's for saving the world like Joe or just really understanding different cultures and experiences. And I just might very quickly tap off. Uh, you can get into the civil service, diplomatic service by applying for the fast stream schemes, or actually there's a website, Civil Service Jobs, that advertises everything across government. So there are different ways to get out. And we encourage applicants from a lot of different areas. So I was trying to cover quite a lot, but it was tied into the confidence point. Thanks. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you, Nicola. Um, uh, just on that point about getting into the civil service, we've had a question about what the fast stream application process is like. So is that something uh, you could maybe cover, Kat? Yeah, of course. So firstly, two quick things. I'm going to quickly mention something about confidence. Firstly, remember, you're not a finished product. I imagine the three of us are a bit older than you are, like I'm in my 30s. You've got plenty of time to build up those experiences and achievements. Um, so try to be aware of that. And also something um, I think that Joe mentioned earlier, I have a tendency to either give myself lots of praise, I've done something really well, or I'm ab absolute trash and there's nothing in between. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that you, you can do normally, learn from, do better subsequently. Um, try not to flip between those two extremes. Um, those are my thoughts on competence. On the fast stream application process, yes, there's lots of steps to it. Um, you go through a bunch of things online from um, the very straightforward kind of um, situational questions and um, then going on to uh, a video interview where there's nobody there and you just have to give answers to specific questions about, uh, about your experience and how you've demonstrated specific behaviours to then an assessment centre and potentially a panel interview. Um, I think that we can give you more information about all of those steps if you want it and we will give an uh, email address at the end and we can share um, more detailed aspects of that. However, one of the things that I would like to um, bring up is the fact that I enjoyed it. I know that that sounds really weird because there's lots of steps to it. It's hard, it's stressful, um, but they focus on a lot of different things that you will be um, looking at if you do join the civil service. Um, so uh, whereas Prior to my PhD, I had worked in I, at IBM, which is fine, plenty of people work at IBM. I didn't enjoy it, I left. And I also didn't enjoy the assessment center process. So it can give you a bit of an idea of whether the sorts of activities that you're asked to do are things that you're actually interested in. Um, I'm not sure how helpful that was, but that's a quick rattle off of the, um, some aspects of the application process. No, thanks, Kat. Um, yeah, I think we'll, we'll definitely share um, a website with some more information about all of that. And um, I'd also say have a look online for the uh, online parts that Kat mentioned. There are practice questions and practice kind of exercises for. So um, we were getting a couple of other questions about how you can best prepare um, kind of whether you should try and get lots of work experience now at university. And I think uh, I don't know if you disagree, Kat, but I would sort of say the best thing you can do is um, practice the things that you'll actually be asked to do. Um, I wouldn't get super caught up in trying to get all of the experience you can possibly can. Um, you just need to know the civil service behaviours and the exercises that you'll be asked to do. Um, I wouldn't worry about trying to get like an internship in every company you've ever heard of. No, it might be challenging at the moment as well. <laughs> True. Can I come, can I come in there? Mm. On the, yeah. Uh, I mean, look, it, 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 don't be daunted by these processes. Um, just, you just rule yourself in. Don't say that's not for me. Say, why not me? Uh, another thing that came out in this workshop yesterday was that research suggests that women 
need to be sort of 80% sure that they've got 80% of the skills or aptitudes covered before they go for something. Men only need 20% and they'll go for it. Now, why is that? that this, this is established research. Now, I don't know why that is. Let's not dwell on it, but let, let's come on. Let's, let's opt in. Let's say this is for me. Let's aim, aim high. Um, and I, I wish I had done that earlier. I did go through all the fast stream, but I got a bit stuck mid-career. Uh, partly because I, I'd had huge responsibilities at home, but also I think I just got a bit stuck and I needed someone to sort of nudge me and say, why not you? You know, what are you doing? And again, in your board of directors, make sure that those people who say, come on, go for it. Why not you? Really, really important. Rule yourself in. Whoever you are, whatever your background is, rule yourself in. Thanks so much. Yeah, that's, um, that's a really brilliant way of thinking about it. I hadn't thought of that. Um, Okay, I'm conscious that we said we would finish at 2.45. So I'd just like to finish with one question which has come up a couple of times, um, which is what your typical day looks like. Um, there may not be a straight answer to that, but uh, Nicola, do you want to have a, have a go? Sure, um, it might be a bit more exciting if it was pre-pandemic. Uh, <laughs> um, so normally it would kick off with, um, so we, we normally have quite high level meetings at the start of the week, like what, what do ministers want, what are the directions they're giving us that come straight from the top, so our foreign secretary. Um, and then uh, you would then, for me, I cascade that. So I oversee um, 53 staff members in different teams. Um, and so I, I will cascade those messaging. Um, and then what I will do, I, I often, um, what, what's really strange as you progress up, you, you end up doing less, <laughs> less sort of writing stuff or writing reports or driving anything. Instead, it's a lot more uh, looking over and commenting, feeding back. Uh, so I read a lot, I read a lot, I comment a lot, particularly on things, advice that are going to ministers. Um, and uh, probably the big bulk, a bit like Joe actually, the bit I really love is uh, the motivating my direct reports and staff. That's the best bit. So my regular one-to-one -one engagement with my team leader is, um, for example, I'll give you a real example. Immediately before this, we had our social and women's uh, committee did a reflection session bringing all the women together across the organisation to reflect on the back of the kidnap and murder of Sarah Everett. Um, so that kind of thing, that sort of initi in initiative is brilliant. Prior to the pandemic, maybe once every month, every six weeks, I'd be travelling abroad, which would be your typical, what you could stereotype, your, your sort of high uh, level representation type diplomacy. So meeting with various people, having handshakes, signing things, uh, occasionally talking to the media, um, including on one occasion accidentally appearing on Russian TV, which is always good fun. And then uh, doing some of that with the teams, which was always brilliant. Then there was the stuff getting stuck in airports, losing luggage. Uh, so I think the people aspects, whether it's the people uh, within my area or whether it's the people I get to engage with uh, around the world and it, as I hear myself speak I realize not only do we use acronyms we also use a lot of buzzwords <laughs> I just heard myself using gauge I'm not a trekkie but that is a very civil service word uh, just to highlight thanks thanks Nicola um Kat, what about what about your typical day? Just sorry, super quick. I know we are running over. It's fine. Um, so I, listening to Nicola speak, it reminded me of when I was in DFT and I was probably on the other end writing the things to send up and convince my deputy director and my director of um, certain things that we wanted to do and uh, writing that we wanted to send up to the minister. Um, I think at the moment. Uh, my current role is a bit unusual because the FSA is a bit unusual. So I probably reflect more on um, 
the work that I did in DFT, uh, which was a mixture of doing very quick response things. So that might be correspondence, um, helping the response writing the response to parliamentary questions um, or other things that needed to be turned around very quickly. That might that, that might be briefings um, to people both in the civil service or potentially ministers. Um, and then the slower things. So building up understanding, building up uh, the background that would go into things like um, <laughs> spending review bids, Sadly, that went nowhere um, and other big pieces of work. So it was a nice combination, I would say, working in a policy team in a big department of that slow work and the fast work. Um, and I thought that gave me a very well-rounded experience. I'm not sure that's a day in the life of, but. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, Right, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I think we're gonna have to leave it there just to make sure that everyone can get on uh, with the rest of their days. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you everyone who has asked questions. I'm sorry if we weren't able to get to your question, we will um, try and sort of pop some answers into the chat. Um, I just wanted to call out, uh, we had one question about, um, uh, someone who was just asking whether the civil service would be accommodating to uh, their needs with Asperger's syndrome and I would say absolutely um, and I would encourage you to maybe there's a session uh, which some of our colleagues are running which I think is straight after this one starting at three o'clock where they have a panel similar to this one um, talking about workplace adjustments uh, and things like that and what the civil service does to accommodate um, whatever type of need or support you might you might need so i would encourage you to have a look at for that session um but thank you everyone who is oh sorry it's 4 p.m <laughs> so you've got a bit of time before that one starts um thanks lynn so yeah thank you so much for joining us um on the screen now you can see uh, our email address if you have any additional questions and also there's a qr code which we would be so grateful if you could uh, just scan that code and do a quick survey just to say how you found this session um just so that we can learn from that because this is the first one like this that we've done um so yeah thank you so much for coming thank you so so much Kat and Joe and Nicola for sharing all of your experiences with us it's been uh really great to learn from all of you I found it really interesting and helpful so I hope I'm sure everyone else has as well um so thank you so much and hope everyone has a great rest of the day thanks Eleanor